Your, Dr. your voice is breaking. Your voice is breaking a little bit. Can you hear me now? Is yes. it better? Yes. It is better. Yeah, yes. slightly better. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> all right, sir. Sorry for that. So, good evening, all. My name is Essen, and I'm the surgical neuro oncology fellow at the Khan University Hospital and member of Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology, PASNO. On behalf of PASNO, I welcome you all to this session. PASNO is organizing the Neuro-Oncology webinar series now, and each session in this webinar series will be an hour long and held on alternate Saturdays. During the talk of our guest speaker, all attendees will be muted to enable the speaker to present without any interruption. Questions can be submitted in the chat box and will be answered once the presenter has finished their talk. Attendees can also raise their hands for questions. We will unmute them to speak. The session will be recorded and the link will be shared on the PASNO website. The speaker will, talk, will take 30 minutes for the topic presentation. And now after that, there will be an open discussion between our esteemed speaker, panelists, and the attendees. The topic of today's session is neuropsychological testing in our craniotomy. And today's speaker is Dr. Rex Yang. Dr. Rex Yang is a clinical professor of neurosurgery at the University of New Mexico, a research scientist at the Mind Research Network, and a practicing clinical neuropsychologist in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His research is designed to relate behavioral measures, including intelligence, personality, and creativity, to brain function and structure in healthy neurological and psychiatric subjects. He has published research articles across a wide range of disciplines, including traumatic brain injury. Dr. Yang is the current president of the International Society for Joining us today. Over to you, sir. Great. Thank you uh, very much. So, uh, much of this will be very rudimentary for neurosurgeons, um, and I apologize for that. Um, you will see where I'm going in the end. There is a theme that uh, I hope to um, draw uh, in this talk that uh, hopefully will convince you that there is some value in adding neuropsychological testing uh, to your uh, awake craniotomy batteries and other uh, neurosurgical uh, interventions that you do. Um, so with that, let's, let's get started. Uh, what is neuropsychology? Uh, so neuro, of course, refers to the brain. Psyche refers to the soul. Uh, I like to refer to psyche as the soul in action uh, or behavior. And uh, ology is the study. So neuro neuropsychology is the study of brain behavior relationships. Uh, it is the integration of brain structure and function as uh, we behave in the external world. It differs from, uh, but includes neurological function, which focuses more specifically on uh, brain. And it differs from, but includes psychiatry, which focuses on uh, mental disorders. The important thing about neuropsychology to understand is that it quantifies behavior. Um, uh, oftentimes your patients will tell you my memory is bad uh, and you will ask them questions about how their memory is bad and trouble finding my keys or tr trouble finding my car in the, in the shopping center. But we are able to uh, quantify the nature and degree of memory dysfunction, attention dysfunction, language dysfunction, and really track that over time by comparing uh, individual performance to normative group performances, which is really the value added of neuropsychological testing and neuropsychological evaluation. So clinical neuropsychology is at the intersection of psychology, neurology, and, uh, and psychiatry. And with this Venn diagram, you see we are uh, at the overlap uh, between these uh, disciplines. So it's a, it's a really um, discrete uh, sub-entity uh, of clinical psychology um, that uh, many people don't quite understand where we fit in. And that's why I'm spending some time to 
uh, help you understand. We're not psychiatrists, we're not neurologists. Uh, we are psychologists with specific understanding of brain structure and function and psychiatric diseases and disorders that allow us to uh, measure and make recommendations to treat uh, both uh, neurological and psychiatric disease. So neuropsychology patients uh, come from a wide range of uh, uh, patient groups from neurological disorders, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, dementia, epilepsy, TBI, traumatic brain injury, tumor, um, psychiatric conditions often overlap uh, with these different uh, diseases and disorders, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder associated with uh, traumatic brain injury, for example. Patients uh, that you see will uh, come to you with uh, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. And then uh, oftentimes patients will have uh, medical issues, uh, liver disease, hepatic issues, um, uh, HIV, lupus, uh, now COVID uh, is providing uh, uh, new challenges and there may be uh, neurological disorders and uh, issues associated with uh, uh, contracting uh, the COVID um, virus. Um, we look at neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, intellectual disability. I was part of uh, the ICD-10 uh, uh, group uh, to help define uh, intellectual uh, disability um, for the next uh, ICD group, uh, learning disorders, genetic conditions. So it's really a, a large group of patients that we uh, tend to address. Um, and I'm going to talk more specifically about tumor, of course, but I want you to see the background of patients that I see in my clinic, uh, uh, in my private practice. I see uh, a, a wide range of patients uh, now in my private practice with traumatic brain injury, lots of dementias, uh, some strange dementias, uh, Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, uh, posterior cortical atrophy, so uh, some interesting dementias, but uh, uh, a wide range of patients uh, in, in my private practice. And I should say that um, the work that I'm going to describe uh, reflects work that was done in the past. Uh, I am now in private practice. I'm not uh, in, in uh, the Department of Neurosy. Uh, when Dr. Chohan uh, moved to Mississippi, uh, I moved into private practice. So this is work that uh, I'm going to be describing that we did uh, in the past. Um, so uh, now I'm a professor of psychology uh, and not uh, neurosurgery. So why would you uh, have neuropsychological evaluation? First, you need diagnostic clarity uh, with all these various diseases and disorders. What, what is actually going on? What is relevant? Uh, to treatment of your patient. If bipolar disorder is, is treated well, do you need to pay specific attention to that? Or is that causing or contributing to cognitive dysfunction in their uh, present um, presentation? Uh, you can track progression over time, which is uh, very important uh, with uh, treatment recommendations that you make uh, with patients that have undergone uh, awake craniotomy and surgical resection of tumors. Uh, we, we always get baseline uh, assessment before uh, surgical intervention, and then we get uh, testing uh, at various time points after to track uh, progression over time and make recommendations for uh, speech and language therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy as patients are recovering from, from their uh, surgical intervention. I do forensic work, about half the work now I do is uh, forensic uh, expert testimony and, and whatnot. Uh, as, as we get uh, older, um, that uh, is, uh, you, you, you young folks will find that as a way to augment your income uh, to uh, do forensic work. Um, and it is actually interesting and challenging working with lawyers. So what is neuropsychology? What is neuropsychological assessment? Uh, we were talking earlier about intelligence uh, and uh, half the people fall below that uh, average line in the bell-shaped curve. Uh, it is uh, the dreaded IQ and, and it is important to understand the nature of the normal distribution of all these abilities, including intelligence. 
uh, that uh, in patients that you see and that uh, their ability levels will match um, and track with their general intellectual functioning. If you have an average patient, um, their attention, their memory, their language should be in that average range and you should have expectations uh, that correspond to their general intellectual functioning. Uh, academics, we look at that, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, the three R's. Um, I won't pay, uh, pay much attention to that uh, for this talk. Attention, we looked at sustained attention, divided attention, alternating attention. It is important uh, in adaptive uh, uh, everyday life uh, to have uh, adequate attention functioning really modulated and by frontal and parietal lobe uh, integrity memory, verbal and visual memory. Uh, again, uh, temporal lobes are very involved in encoding and retrieval uh, integrated with frontal lobe uh, functioning uh, for memory. Uh, language, receptive and expressive language, uh, particular regions of the brain that we'll talk about uh, involved in uh, language functioning, Broca's and Wernicke's area uh, in particular, but now we're finding that uh, uh, supplementary motor area and other regions of the brain, and particularly white matter functioning, acetylene tracts, and, and so on, are particularly important to uh, the smooth operation of language functioning, visual spatial construction, drawing, executive planning, judgment, monitoring of behavior, um, personality, mood. Uh, these are things that are incredibly important uh, to adaptive functioning out in the world. And we are able to uh, look at and evaluate each of these in turn. So uh, we use a group of sensitive standardized tests to assess brain dysfunction uh, across these uh, various uh, disorders. So intelligence tests might look like something like this, where you have an array uh, of designs and you are to find which would go uh, in the space to complete the pattern. This is a standard matrix reasoning type task. Uh, I won't uh, test, well, I can test Dr. Chohan to see uh, if he has, uh, <laughs> it's a little early, so he might make a mistake, uh, but the correct answer, I believe, is number five. Uh, you have two, three, and one. You have uh, stippled white and black. And so you have black stippled and you need some white, you need some two. So uh, that goes in there, I believe, if uh, it's not too early for me. Uh, you have uh, academics, Terps of Korean, uh, very difficult uh, words that we can assess pre-morbid types of abilities. Uh, you would have uh, come across this word in uh, the complexity of your reading and exposure to uh, language. We have attention types of tasks where we might point to these blocks in certain order and then have you repeat that uh, uh, order back to us. Uh, we can say different numbers and have you repeat those back to us in a certain order to test your uh, uh, sustained attention and then working memory, keeping something in mind, for example, and then having you repeat these numbers back in reverse order. Um, memory, having you copy a complex design and then coming back 30 minutes later and uh, having you recall that, com that complex design. Uh, language, having you name uh, particular items uh, in your uh, bedside assessment. You might have someone, you know, name a ring or a pen or something like that, but we have tests uh, that are much more sensitive, uh, naming things that are much more complex, like a globe, uh, and being able to give uh, uh, semantic cues. It's, it's uh, something used for uh, uh, topography or actually giving them a phonemic cue. It starts with the sound gl and being able to see if someone can uh, retrieve that from phonemic men memory. Visual spatial being able to look at orientation of different lines and uh, lining those up, uh, visual spatial orientation. Uh, executive function being able to uh, sort things by color, uh, by shape, and by number. And uh, conforming to a specific uh, set of rules that we uh, may or may not uh, let you know in real time. Uh, personality functioning, again, mood uh, and personality are important to adaptive functioning. And now for something completely different, this is our past work um, that we've done together. And, and just as part of review, I think we're coming up on uh, almost 100 years uh, of awake craniotomy with uh, Wilder Penfield, 
and Roberts uh, having their book, Speech and Brain Mechanisms in 1959, uh, looking at the uh, uh, electrical stimulation of the surface of the brain. I was able to find an article in 1930 that refers to a uh, procedure done in 1925, again, almost 100 years ago, electrical exploration, exploration showed the lesion to lie just posterior to the motor area for the fingers. Um, so this has been going on for close to 100 years, uh, this awake craniotomy and electrical stimulation of the surface of the brain uh, to understand uh, the uh, organization of the cerebral cortex and the particular uh, uh, functional regions of the brain. And I'll point out to you this quote uh, from this article, it is essential that patients should be in sympathy with the operator and anesthetist. And it is an interesting comment on the bravery and fortitude of mankind that almost without exception, these subjects have gone through the ordeal of operation patiently and intelligently, even when young children. In our experience uh, with Dr. Chohan, uh, we had uh, we were able to successfully conduct awake craniotomies in uh, all patients. Uh, we had uh, uh, no failures, uh, essentially. Uh, patients would occasionally wake up uh, extremely disoriented. We would have to calm them down. Uh, patients uh, would uh, get very tired. We would have to encourage them, but all patients were able to uh, undergo, to varying degrees, of course, uh, the awake craniotomy procedure. Even a young boy, uh, at the age of uh, 16, I believe, was able to, uh, uh, in our hands, undergo this awake craniotomy procedure. It was, uh, uh, again, a testament to the patients, but also important uh, to have a relationship with them uh, beforehand to establish and, and set their expectations appropriately. Um, I don't think I'm going to spend a lot of time uh, with this. Uh, a lot of you know uh, the organization of uh, the motor and sensory cortex that was established by Penfield, um, the uh, development of the homunculus and the very uh, um, discreet localization of uh, individual uh, sensory and motor components of the face, the tongue, the hands, the fingers. Uh, George Ojeman, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, uh, is more interesting to neuropsychologists because with this discrete uh, organization of the cerebral cortex, uh, we learned uh, from some of his studies that, uh, you know, Broca's area, Wernicke's area are well known to neuropsychologists and neurosurgeons, uh, but there was some blurriness uh, to the regions that were associated with uh, language uh, functioning and aphasia uh, in, in particular patients. And, and his work was really important to understand and to begin to understand the network connectivity uh, that is involved uh, in language functioning uh, in patients. And uh, I just leave this as a placeholder um, for later to really get you thinking about the network characteristics of the brain and uh, this early work that started to show that even though we know Broca's area, often uh, pars opercularis, pars triangularis, a very discrete localization uh, of this region, um, it, it wasn't so clear when you did electrical stimulation uh, and there were oftentimes uh, patient where uh, patients where you would stimulate Broca's area and evoke no language changes in 21% of the subjects in the superior temporal gyrus essential areas were identified in 65% of the subjects. It wasn't 100% of the time uh, that you saw uh, these regions be essential uh, to language functioning. So we started to see the integration of different uh, brain regions uh, and the network characteristics of the brain uh, underlying language functioning, for example. So I uh, have given this talk in the past, but uh, uh, it's not the past and it's not the present. So uh, I'm going to talk about this as the recent past. Uh, and we had a great team, uh, including a neurosurgeon, a neuropsychologist, anesthesiologist, electrophysiologist, neuroimaging and oncologist, um, where we were able to uh, work with, uh, I, I think, close to 120 uh, individual patients while we were uh, 
uh, in uh, New Mexico together. It was a really great team, really uh, wonderful uh, time in my life to work with such a fantastic and, and professional group of individuals. And, and we learned a lot um, during this time. I'll show you some of what we learned. This is the basic setup with Dr. Chohan on one side, the, the clean side uh, of the uh, uh, surgical field. Uh, this is the anesthesiologist, but I'm taking some pictures just to kind of show uh, where the neuropsychologist will be with the patient. We'll be talking to the patient over on this side. And um, I'm this and, uh, a bit. Um, be working with the patient over on this side. Dr. Chohan is looking at the stealth and trying to uh, figure out uh, the regions that we're going to be working with. But uh, this is the standard procedure. Uh, for neuropsychological uh, testing where you have a dirty side and the neuropsychologist talking to the patient under here and the neurosurgeon stimulating the patient uh, up above. Uh, let's see if I can advance this. There we go. We were able to do some very interesting things during this awake procedure. You can see an iPad here where we can uh, 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 um, present stimuli to the patient. Um, we use this uh, intermittently, um, oftentimes uh, uh, a simple uh, language testing and motor testing uh, was sufficient for our purposes. This happens to be a patient that uh, was musically adept and we had his left temporal lobe uh, uh, exposed and we wanted to explore the nature of uh, music. And we brought in a music professor from uh, the department that I'm collaborating with and uh, did some stimulation of Wernicke's area while he was uh, either uh, reciting uh, music that is very familiar to him or reciting uh, uh, just tones that were repeated to him. And we found some interesting uh, dichotomy, I'll let you listen to this. This is a uh, Oh Susanna, a familiar song, and you'll hear. The words go away as he's getting stimulated in Winnicky's area. So the tunes. <laughs> So Dr. Dr. Chowen is saying that the tone is intact and the words are going away, which is exactly right. So stimulating Wernicke's area, uh, the tone remains uh, intact and the, and the words are becoming uh, garbled. And then uh, in the next iteration, uh, we have uh, the music professor providing him uh, tones, stimulating the same uh, area in Wernicke's uh, uh, region. So you get the idea. So stimulating that same area and the tones are not affected by stimulating that same area. So really nice uh, test of, uh, of uh, this dichotomy we had hoped to open up the, the right temporal lobe as well and get uh, a dissociation where uh, the tones were affected and the words were not uh, in the right hemisphere. Uh, we weren't able to uh, complete that, but uh, some very uh, interesting uh, work that we were able to do uh, with patients uh, in this awake set, uh, setting. Ready? And then of course, um, with our uh, work together, uh, Dr. Chohan was able to do some very aggressive uh, surgical resections. This is perhaps one of the most impressive uh, aggressive surgical resections. There was previous resection that was done in this patient uh, in a couple of areas, but uh, this is a GBM that uh, had really uh, progressed and, and uh, the resection from the, the anterior temporal lobe to the occipital lobe uh, was quite um, extensive and doing this uh, awake uh, allowed the patient to remain uh, intact, but it's almost a 12 centimeter uh, resection, quite quite impressive, and the patient was able to remain intact. And if I'm not um, mistaken, this patient, um, uh, you know, was able to um, uh, function uh, normally enough. 
uh, uh, following the surgery and then uh, attend um, his daughter's graduation. So uh, before passing from uh, GBM, but uh, very, very aggressive uh, surgeries that we were able to perform with the patients uh, awake uh, and um, ensuring that uh, critical uh, functions were uh, left intact. Another patient, uh, you, just to give you some examples, uh, again, seeing a thumbs up uh, before the resection, you can see uh, brain exposed with uh, uh, obviously uh, abnormal brain tissue, uh, and then uh, surgical resection, uh, again, with leaving uh, a lot of the uh, vasculature uh, intact, but really uh, spending time to be able to get uh, ma maximal surgical resection and leave this patient uh, bragged uh, coming in later that he was skiing on the slopes uh, uh, in deep powder uh, after the surgery and, and uh, very excited to be uh, left uh, uh, physically and mentally uh, intact following uh, this surgery. And then a 29-year-old uh, right-handed female. Um, I've talked about this patient a lot, and we'll show you an article that uh, I wrote about her. She presented with uh, migraines with aura, loss of short-term memory, recognition problems in reading, word-finding difficulties. She was found to have a left temporal mass. This is a note that Dr. Chohan wrote. Um, uh, to that effect, uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, contrast enhancing mass in, in the posterior left temporal lobe. Um, she had uh, right uh, superior quadrantinopsia. Um, we proceeded to do the surgery. This is the uh, exposed brain with uh, a tumor uh, down here in the posterior aspect of her temporal lobe uh, following surgery. Um, uh, there's a surgical resection going down into the temporal lobe or hippocampus uh, was involved. Her memory was uh, impaired, but uh, then the testing we can do pre and post testing, uh, looking at her functioning, her attention uh, was not affected uh, by uh, uh, the surgery. This is just three months uh, following surgery and she was still undergoing uh, radiation chemotherapy. So um, you know, there is going to be some effects of that on her cognitive functioning. Uh, her memory actually was starting to come back. Previously, she was in the impaired range. Standard scores are like IQ scores, and these were in the 70s and 60s uh, before surgery and, and are bouncing back up to the average range, which is very nice uh, following this surgery. Her verbal memory uh, was uh, still uh, impaired. This is uh, in that left temporal lobe. Um, coming back uh, more slowly, um, but you can really track this over time with very detailed testing, executive functioning, uh, not affected uh, by this, uh, spatial functioning, of course, not affected, verbal fluency, she had word finding difficulty, we give letters of the alphabet F, A, and S, and ask you to tell as many words you can think of that start with F, for example, and she was in the impaired range. Now she's bounced back to the low average range following this surgery. So very nice improvements uh, for her. Uh, I wrote an article in Psychology Today. She's a very interesting patient um, and um, with her spirituality and, and uh, her um, journey uh, in this, she did end up passing away uh, following uh, a couple of years following this surgery. And um, a, an interesting story, if you're interested in uh, the, uh, uh, my interactions with her, it, we published this in Psychology Today, uh, uh, not a medical um, journal by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, 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 to give you a different flavor of interacting with awake craniotomy patients. And what I like to ask, um, young researchers when they're giving any talk is, so what? What does this all mean uh, when you put this all together? And the so what question I think comes down to, we're starting to publish papers um, looking at neuropsychological correlates of various uh, structural brain uh, attributes that we can measure. And so our first paper in brain communication looked at subcortical contribution to higher cognitive functioning in tumor patients undergoing awake craniotomy. We found uh, uh, right caudate to be highly predictive of intelligence, which has been found 
uh, previously in the normal literature. Um, interesting, the left pallidum uh, was related to total neuropsychological functioning or global neuropsychological functioning, right hippocampus to mood. Um, so some of these uh, structures really were predictive of neuropsychological functioning uh, down the road. And we looked at laterality of lesion, left pallidum volume. You can see the tumor um, kind of compressing uh, the globus pallidus uh, and uh, uh, affecting total neuropsychological performance, we believe, uh, or is implied uh, in this uh, preliminary type of study. And again, it implies this network uh, uh, including uh, subcortical structures, basal ganglia structures that contribute to higher cortical functioning, which we know from both uh, lesion research, stroke research, and normal fMRI studies, uh, but again is implied uh, by uh, these tumor studies. Um, so again, back to Ojeman, we see this, um, this nice uh, cartoon looking at Broca's and Wernicke's area and uh, supplementary motor area and different regions that are, are uh, stimulated and related to uh, language functioning in, in normal brain. And I want you to think, uh, Dr. Chauhan sent me uh, a, a recent article um, in, um, let me uh, change this, right. in Frontiers in Neurology um, showing the network underpinnings of uh, the human brain and the appreciation that we need to have of that in evaluating cognitive functioning in our patients. And so this is the speech production pathways, uh, looking at the superior longitudinal fasciculus, the arcuate fasciculus, the uh, Aslan track and uh, uh, connecting Broca's area to supplementary motor area. Um, and, and really starting to flesh out some of the things that were implied in uh, Ojeman's uh, stimulation studies and, and really helping us to understand, uh, for, for, for example, how uh, language functioning uh, works in the brain and how to keep these networks intact uh, or functioning uh, uh, um, optimally uh, in our uh, resection procedures. Um, so that's all I have. I don't know how much time I took. Uh, hopefully it was close to half an hour um, and I'm happy to take your questions um, as they occur. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. That was fantastic. Thank I think you. Umar, Umar, you can take over, Rick. So, uh, Dr. Atu, yeah, I think there's like some, to... some issue with the uh, SN, your, uh, uh, your, your comments, or your about... microphone. Yeah. Can, can SN, you you're, you're not, we, can't, okay. we can't hear you better. So, uh, I was requesting the director of the uh, series to take over. Uh, unfortunately, the connection. Okay, sir, can you hear me now? Sir, yes, can you yes, yes, we can, we okay. can hear you. So, uh, sorry, sorry for that. So don't that was fantastic talk, Dr. Young, and thank you so much for the talk. Dr. Inam, would you like to add some comments, please? No, I'm not here to add comments. I'm here to ask questions. I'm here to learn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so, okay. Uh, so yeah, that was very uh, interesting. But uh, so I can ask questions uh, following. Uh, I think Altaf has his hands up. Uh, uh, so, Professor Young, uh, Dr. Altaf is uh, a neurosurgeon, a neuro-oncologist, uh, fellowship trained, and now he's doing a PhD in, uh, in uh, neuro-oncology. So, you know, he, just, he is a man who is wearing a lot of hats. I don't know which hat he's going to wear, not asking you the question. Dr. Altaf, go ahead, please. Hopefully not an oncology hat, which I know nothing about. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> So I uh, thank you very much. Very fascinating talk, and uh, we we have learned a lot. And uh, the intriguing part of this talk was that neuropsychology is often ignored part of uh, uh, part of um, aspect, especially for neuroscience. Be it trauma, be it oncology, be it spine problem, we often become a kind of a fixator of his spine or removal of tumor, that's it. But then, then this aspect, which is very subtle, 
but very important for human being to live in society. So very intriguing and very fascinating talk. So my question was, oftentimes when we, we operate on patients awake and, and there is, we, we notice that there is change in the behavior, either in language or there is some behavioral issue or there is a change of language. We have multilingual patients. At that moment, we feel that there is still a residual disease Navigation is telling us, our eyes are telling us, microscope is telling us, mm -hmm. but there is some problem with the speech or psychology of patient, or there is a switch in language. So at this, at that specific moment, what should we do? Stop surgery or we continue? Uh, so this is this is kind of intriguing aspect of awake neurotomy. Any comment from Dr. Chohan or Dr. Jung? will be appreciated. And another question from Dr. Jung. Dr. Jung, are you related to uh, the- uh, 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 no, 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 stop, 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 stop. No question. That, that, <laughs> just scratch that question out, please. All right, next. So I will take the second question first. Um, <laughs> I, I have a GoFundMe account uh, to help me <laughs> discover if I am related to uh, Carl Young. And you yes. can contribute uh, to my GoFundMe account uh, to help me discover, but I do not have any uh, knowledge of relationship to Carl Young. Uh, to, so. <laughs> but uh, uh, for, your first, for your first question, it's very interesting. So Dr. Choen and I worked uh, very closely together and very successfully together. And uh, from my perspective, uh, we, we often uh, elicited behavioral changes in patients. And um, that was the point of doing this uh, awake uh, is to uh, determine the, uh, the precise boundary we needed to stop in order to um, not hurt the patient. So oftentimes Dr. Chowen would be working I would uh, tell him that the uh, patient is having difficulty talking and Dr. Chohan would back off. And uh, oftentimes, uh, most of the time, uh, uh, the uh, function would uh, return uh, in this patient. So you could actually go uh, right up to the edge and elicit um, uh, behavioral changes and, and really test this, but then back off, work somewhere else. And the neurons uh, appeared to recover from the stress that he was producing uh, to them transiently. So I think that uh, back and forth, rather than just stop because you produced uh, a, a temporary uh, lesion, if you will, uh, but returning to that to see if the patient returned to baseline uh, is critically important. And testing that repeatedly over time uh, was really part of, of, of our standard procedure. Maybe Dr. Chohan can add to that. Before Dr. Chohan adds, uh, you know, we, we will send you a certificate at, you know, uh, by, by mail uh, about your participation. And with that, we will send you this. So you can, <laughs> you can laminate. You can laminate that. Yes, yes, yes. Bring <laughs> it over there. Go to your next conference. You know, so that, will be, so, that will be very helpful in my practice and in my life <laughs> in general. <laughs> All right, sorry, Umar, go ahead, please. Yeah, I uh, I agree with uh, with what Dr. Young just said. Um, I think <clears throat> it's an art. Uh, I'm still learning, um, as um, as Dr. Nam will uh, will also uh, suggest, perhaps from his own experience. Um, it's very difficult when you start doing these cases to really know when you have crossed that red line, and is there a red line? Uh, so when we started doing these, we were just trying to discover in our own hands with our own team, because each team is different. Um, the relationship between the neuropsychologist or, or whoever is um, uh, is doing the testing on the other end uh, and the neurosurgeon is very important. The trust uh, and the fluidity of how these behavioral testing is done and understood by the surgeon um, uh, is, uh, is, is a matter of experience, is a matter of uh, an art. So is there a red line uh, when that red line appears and can you uh, tease uh, or push the boundaries uh, in surgery, how many times you can do that and successfully come back from it uh, is, um, 
I'm still learning that, but I think um, Rex just summarized it very nicely. You know, once the, the, the idea is to get to that red line, the idea is to elicit a behavioral response, whether positive or negative. Um, uh, and then obviously you, you're not allowed to sacrifice function under any circumstances. Um, uh, if you understand, uh, or if you have a thorough understanding of the function that you're trying to preserve, oftentimes we don't have a full understanding of the function that you're trying to preserve. So for example, you know, if you're trying to figure out where, where something as fundamental as speech is, uh, it's not that easy. Um, you know, you will have sites that are uh, that produce speech arrest, other sites that pr produce speech hesitancy, other sites that produce anomia. So can you sacrifice sites that produce uh, speech hesitancy? Um, are you able to miss, can you misinterpret speech hesitancy sites for speech arrest sites? So this is just uh, um, like anything else, you know, you put in your 10,000 hours at the minimum and, um, uh, and then learn. Yeah, uh, so, so, you know, I, I totally agree with uh, you and uh, Dr. Taf's question is very valid because what, when we go ahead and push our boundaries a little bit and we see a little change, uh, so not so much in neuropsychology, which I was gonna to talk to you about later on, uh, so we, we step, we, 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 we step, uh, take a step back, we wait, and then we still go on. And, uh, Saqib, uh, he's not here right now. Uh, we are, uh, we are going to submit that work. And I'm sure that is what we have found in other places also that these deficits that we see in the patients post-operatively, uh, which, where we stopped, we don't know where the red line was, but we stopped sort of, you know, okay, we are going to stop now they recover very well. And uh, so I, I'm assuming the neuropsych uh, aspect also is the same way, uh, which brings me to my question to you that I was asking before we open up this uh, webinar to the audience, is that, you know, uh, in, a, in an LMIC, in a, in a resource limited setting, um, a lot of time we have problems um, in, in uh, involving the uh, right kind of experts uh, to build a team. So um, over here, I have had a significant problem trying to get the get a good neuropsychologist to work. There are some neuropsychologists, but they are so busy. So what are your thoughts uh, about, uh, you know, how are how do you handle that? If we focus on some of the very clear cut functions, speech, speech hesitation, um, uh, you know, uh, anomia, uh, identification of objects on the screen, and then motor functions. And we just use those. And we assume that, uh, we assume that if we can uh, save those, then we will also save a ballpark range of the neuropsychological status of the patient. I think that's a very good question. And uh, Omar, Dr. Chon and I have talked about this a lot. I, I think uh, this ballparking that you're talking about is perhaps a very important fundamental point that uh, we have to consider going into the future. Motor and speech functioning, maybe that's enough. Um, and uh, we certainly found in our patients that really focusing um, quite discreetly on um, motor and speech functioning um, helped us preserve a wide range of higher cognitive functioning. Um, so that is true, and I think you know we will be publishing, and other people will be publishing um, to support um, this fundamental attribute of higher cognitive functioning. And Omar and I have had many philosophical conversations about language being the 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 the, the basic uh, core element of human cognitive uh, co uh, functioning. So I, I think that being said, um, that that it, it remains to be seen what the research will show. Um, there are people who are trying to get in very discrete aspects of visual spatial processing and executive functioning and preserving mood functioning. And, and I think that work is important. We may find 
uh, that just paying attention to some of these networks, as I talked about in my talk, uh, the default mode network, the uh, central executive network, and keeping them as intact as possible um, may be enough. Um, that's your first, my first point for the several questions that you <laughs> raised. Uh, the second question is, or, which gets back to the first issue is, um, yeah, neuropsychologists are very busy and they fund their themselves by seeing a lot of patients. Um, there's two types of neuropsychologists. There's those who are very interested and devoted to patient care and testing. There's neuropsychologists that are very interested in research. And I think if you can find a neuropsychologist that is very interested in research, they will work for you for free because this is a gold mine of research papers that can fall out of uh, this type of work. And a neuropsychologist will see this opportunity as I did uh, with Dr. Chohan um, to uh, get at fundamental aspects of brain structure and function that every neuropsychologist worth his medal or her medal um, should be interested in uh, understanding and writing about. So you have to find a neuropsychologist that isn't just interested in seeing patient after patient um, clinically, but is interested in, in, in writing uh, and in, in ideas. And that's harder to find. So, so you know, it's like, it's like in, a, in a setting over here, for example, we have to go from point A to point B and there's no vehicle and you know you have uh, some motorbikes and uh, you know uh, safety is a significant issue but then we're talking about automatic uh, you know uh, brake system or we're talking about the uh, uh, airbags i mean here we have to deal with the helmets for the for the motorcyclists right so 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 I think, you know, uh, that I'm not saying that it's a luxury of the HIC or high income countries. I would love to have that. And I know when I talked to Ugi Dufault, so Ugi Dufault got very upset when I talked to him about it, that, you know, I do it without that. And he was like making gestures with his hands, you know, oh, yes, use some, use some four languages that, you know, how can you do that or blah, 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 you know. So he, he sometimes gets gets that upset, but you know I I really like him. He's he's, he's a great guy. Yeah. So so he 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 just he was he was totally intolerant of me doing awake craniotomy without a neuropsychologist. I was trying to explain him that Ugi, look, I don't have that ability. So, right. so but then that, that's the way I look at it. And at the, from my perspective, the end the end point is that can I get the patient back to his uh, a normal routine life, maybe, you know, a little bit compromised, but can that person get back to earning money for his family or can I give him two more years of reasonable life? Um, yeah. You know, he has some deficits. Uh, so, so, you know, I was thinking, uh, I was thinking about this just now that maybe we can, uh, in retrospect, look at all my patients that were taken care of without neuropsych testing and somehow if we can compare uh the way that they uh, were able to incorporate back into their normal life and compare that with those that had an excessive testing so we can't do a randomized randomized control on this one no but that's a good start that's a good start to uh, be able to do that comparison and i think that would be appropriate another thing um i mean dr chohan um I, you know this is uh going to denigrate myself a little bit but uh he yells through the curtains quite a bit, and uh, <laughs> oh I knew, I knew that, I knew he had. He always had a smiling face, but I know this. But I mean, he 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 will he will test both the patients and myself. Uh, so I mean, it is possible to ask the patients to do things. Um, to say things, to do things. And I mean, it is possible uh, if you have, for example, an anesthesiologist that you work with um, uh, regularly uh, to have them do the motor testing and have them uh, help with the procedure. Um, if, if there's a, some, you don't have to have uh, a fancy neuropsychologist to do this, but to have someone uh, on the other side that can help and be your eyes and ears, I think is, is really critical. O obviously having a neuropsychologist is optimal, but um, having someone to be your eyes and ears on the other side uh, of the curtain is, is what we're talking about. And um, that can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, 
Um, uh, I, I'm uh, talking a bit uh, against my profession, uh, but um, to, to help you uh, on the ground where you are, um, I think uh, it is possible to do this without a neuropsychologist. Um, and uh, I, I think doing what you're talking about, comparing patients with this type of uh, uh, work with those without would be a good first start, even though it's not randomized, you know, uh, controlled uh, study, uh, at least comparing those outcomes would be a good first start. Yeah. Asen, what do you think? Should we should we do that study? And then we can have, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Chohan's team um, pick up 100 uh, uh, retros, uh, you know, 100 patients. So we have we have we have data on more than 200 patients over here now. Uh, so we can we may have to go back and reinterview them. Right. right. Uh, uh, and then uh, Umar, you can pick up and, you know, Dr. Young and your team can, if you have some resident, someone to do this study. Would love to help. Um, I, again, I, I am very interested and remain very interested uh, in, in, in this work. And if I can stay uh, involved in this work uh, as, as a neuropsychologist, uh, um, I would love to. So uh, I would love to help if, if, if possible. Dr. Talha Abbas had a question. Somebody had a question. I yes, guess. sir. So Dr. Talha Abbas has a question. And I think Dr. Dilawar also raised his hand. So I'm going to read Dr. Talha's question. And later oh, we can Dr. ask Talha, you. Dr. Maybe Dr. Talha can ask him himself, and uh, um, if he wants to, we can unmute him. Yeah. Right. Can't he unmute himself, Dr. Talha? So if you want, you can ask. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Sir? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. You you, you muted again, Dr. You muted again. Can you please unmute yourself? <coughs> Dr. Tala, you're muted again. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So here you go. And just introduce yourself also uh, to all the audience. That would be nice. Well, sir, I'm uh, Dr. Talha from uh, uh, Fatma Jinnah Medical University, Lahore. I'm working here as an assistant professor. Well, over here, a vacant not me is, uh, I think, a luxury. I'm trying to move towards it with the uh, neuroscience monitoring, I don't know how uh, successful I would be. Well, I think uh, at the first step, it was like uh, you see if there is any change in the motor system. And uh, secondly, if there is any change in the, in the speech. And now I feel that uh, uh, after this talk, we'll have to uh, see any subtle changes in the uh, behavior of the patients on the table. So I was wondering uh, how familiar you need to be with the patient, how long should it take to, to understand uh, uh, the particular features of the uh, psychology of that patient? And has you categorized these patients uh, according to the, you know, their behaviors that, uh, yeah, in this kind of patient, if uh, this kind of change appears, we are already going to doing, uh, we are already in the red zone. That's a very good question. So what we did with our patients is I would meet with them the morning of the surgery and go over the items that I was going to use for testing that morning uh, right before the surgery, um, just to ensure that I understood what they could and couldn't do at that moment uh, before surgery. So see how their strength is in their hands and their foot. Um, look at their face and see what uh, you know their motor system is is able to do, and then if I'm presenting them uh, pictures, for example, like globe and lion and chair, um, go over those with them and remove the ones that they could not name in that moment, uh, so that I could see exactly what they could do and and optimize their uh, their correct performance at that point. Then in the surgery, when we wake them up, we ended up doing awake, awake, awake uh, procedures. But when, we, uh, when they emerged from whatever anesthesia, um, we have that optimized performance and we could get them back to that baseline and make sure that they could name all of those items, their strength was uh, intact. So we're back to baseline. So we have that starting point, uh, that baseline to work with. So 
that I think is a very good procedure. We, we had great success uh, in doing that uh, because if I tested them a week or two before that, a lot of things can change with the tumor and steroids and uh, a lot of things can change uh, between the time that I saw them in my laboratory and the time uh, that their uh, the, uh, their surgery was. So uh, I would come in and test them, uh, you know, uh, an hour before they went into uh, the surgical room, and I think that's the best way to proceed. Get their baseline that day uh, when they emerge from uh, anesthesia. Re reestablish their baseline, and then you you know where you're you know where which point you're starting from. I, I think that's a great. I think you uh, mentioned, um, uh, Doctor Young. Uh, you mentioned something uh, in passing, uh, but I'm just going to emphasize on that. Um, you you mentioned that we started doing awake, 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 and I think that is also very important. Emergence yeah. from anesthesia versus yeah. keeping them awake the entire time with yeah. some Presidex, perhaps with some, um, uh, you know, fentanyl, a little bit something on board, but not completely, um, you know, have them under anesthesia is also very important. Uh, because yeah. if you, you know, if you, if you recall, we had, we had one patient way early on um, uh, with a left insular temporal uh, tumor that we, we thought that we would, you know, do some early mapping, take the temporal lobe out, put them to uh, put them to sleep while we were removing the temporal lobe before going into the insula. And she was, uh, she just never emerged fully for us to be comfortable uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in going. So I think that the, the technique that you're using um, uh, for, to conduct these surgeries is also very important. Uh, Dr. Nam, uh, what 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 do you use? Do you uh, do you keep yeah, them yeah. asleep so we, at the we, beginning? We and... use, yeah, we also use awake, awake, awake because uh, of our limitations right. in terms of. But sometimes when the pa when we are done with it and the patient is like very tired, then we let them go. Yeah. To do <clears throat> the yeah. Part. But Dr. Talabas, thank you for bringing this question up honestly, uh, and 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 Professor Young, uh, thank you for answering that question because that gives me uh, something to think about and I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to Asan and Altaf that maybe we should do the same thing that you know an hour before we go over all that uh, tests and then exclude those which that person so only the positive ones we keep that in an armamentarium and that's Correct. what we uh, uh, ask the questions uh, from, the, uh, from the from the patient what do you think I mean that's that's uh, I, I, I never thought about that that asking them. I think the other thing, uh, the other thing that uh, you guys should also do is um, maybe maybe Dr. Young can help um, in in standardizing a battery um, right. of uh, of tests because if you use an anesthesiologist or somebody who's just a neuro monitoring person who has no clue, um, like, uh, you you usually, know, it, we usually end up with an intern. End up with right. An intern. Yeah. Right. So, so that an intern who's just asking random questions, right? Right. But you right. wanna. You want to be very, um, you know, methodical about it, uh, mm -hmm. and have the same set of uh, of batteries that, uh, like like Rex said, um, I mean, if you have that those set of standardized batteries, and I think uh, Rex can uh, can provide you with those and uh, you know help you develop uh, one of yours that can be done easily. That could be a paper in itself that you know doing a very um, um, you know methodical. Um, way uh, of testing for various, you know, various areas of the brain that you're interested in. Uh, yeah. And you may end up saving a lot of time because not all language patients will will need, you know, a certain batteries or vice versa. So that could also be um, an important avenue to explore. Thank you. Dr. Dilawar was asking, is Dr. Dilawar yeah. here? Did... Yeah, he's here. So Dr. Dilawar, if you're here, you can unmute yourself. We have already given you that option. Thank you, Dr. Talal, for that question. Okay, so Dr. Dilawar actually is asking about the overall prognosis. So the question is only that. Tell us about the overall prognosis. Dr. Dilawar, if you can unmute and you can ask, you want to ask yourself. All right, Dr. Young, over to you. <laughs> Prognosis. Um, I don't 
quite know what to what he's referring to. I, you know, so we follow patients um, uh, after the surgery. We what we found uh, is we tested them at three months. Um, we ended up extending that to six months following surgery. Oftentimes, patients were in the midst of uh, chemotherapy and radiation uh, at three months, and their neuropsychological performance was horrible. Um, so uh, this uh, is impacting um, our prognosis or our outcome measures because they are undergoing uh, procedures that are affecting uh, their cognitive functioning. So we extended that to six months. Um, we found a nice bounce back um, to uh, you know baseline performance and is a much better uh, prognostic uh, 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 evaluation. And it, of course, a year um, out, uh, the, the patients that we could get back uh, a year after the surgery, then that's uh, the best uh, prognosis. And, and again, we're still evaluating that data to see how well we did. Um, obviously, these are uh, oftentimes very sick patients. Some of the patients will die uh, from their disease, um, and um, we weren't able to get everyone back. But uh, um, the prognosis for the vast majority of the patients or the outcomes for the vast majority of the patients were, um, were quite good um, from my perspective. But we did discover that uh, three months uh, post-surgery was not an appropriate time to evaluate cognitive prognosis. Interesting. Excellent. Yeah. No more. Uh, I think the chat. I want. I want. I want. Quick, I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. I, and I'm, my my apologies to all the audience. I wanted to ask you how. What questions were you asking about the intelligence when you were going to the caudate? How are you assessing the intelligence when you're going to caudate? Um, so we're just, it's a correlative study, um, and people are looking at volumes of the caudate. Uh, one of my former graduate students, so I, I have uh, done uh, a lot of work in intelligence, and we established a theory called the parietal frontal integration theory of intelligence, or PFIT. Um, and it's a cortical network that overlaps significantly with the cognitive control network or, uh, of uh, the human brain. So one of my students looked at some subcortical structures and correlated that with intelligence in normal uh, subjects, college students, and found that the caudate uh, volumes uh, correlated uh, significantly with intelligence, which added to our knowledge of the, the PFIT. And we know that the caudate uh, is an important uh, node in the frontal subcortical network. Um, so it's not surprising that the caudate nucleus would be involved. What we did is we looked at, uh, we, we threw all of the um, uh, basal ganglia uh, structures and the thalamus into regression equations and, and asked, asked uh, what uh, aspects of higher cognitive functioning they were predictive of. And so we found, not surprisingly, that the caudate was uh, predictive of intelligence in these uh, patients with tumors, um, uh, which uh, is consistent with that previous research uh, done in normal human subjects. Thank you. So, sir, I think it's time. I wanted to ask a question, but I think we are over time. Please so, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, all right, sir. So, so I'll take this opportunity. So Dr. Dr. Chohan likes to see me. Dr. Chohan likes to see me squirm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a. So, so I, I was just wondering, do you think, sir, Dr. Young, like in future, we, there might be a role of antidepressant or anxiolytics like prophylactic use for the patients undergoing away craniotomies or something like that? What are your thoughts about that? Absolutely. Um, not during, uh, perhaps not during away craniotomies. I think, um, well, at least in our hands, we, we did a... a, a a reasonably good job of keeping patients calm. And uh, the anesthesiologist was wonderful in adding some magic elixir that I didn't fully understand. If the patient was uh, getting uh, anxious, they could uh, add uh, uh, something to the mix um, uh, to, to help calm them. But Dr. Chowen and I have talked about um, cognitive outcomes and looking at different um, uh, uh, metabolic uh, uh, interventions 
that could optimize um, serotonergic or dopaminergic uh, function in patients that have damage to these different networks. Maybe Dr. Chohan can talk more about that because he knows more about that. But I think uh, adding some uh, medications to the mix in the recovery phase, uh, I think would, would be a very interesting study to optimize uh, outcome. That can be randomized controlled trial, Dr. Arthur, if you are looking okay. for one. Go for it, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that <laughs> as in you just uh, uh, stole, stole our idea. We yeah. actually wrote a randomized trial. Yeah, right. Uh, I think no, no, offline... that's not true. What, that was Asin's idea, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, I st and I stole it. <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, you and I can talk offline. I've, yes. I've actually already written about it. Oh. Um, uh, together, and but that's something that we could uh, perhaps do uh, at, at, at both. Yeah, at both institutions. Yeah. I was just struggling to find a, um, a an industry sponsor uh, for the trial. We have a lot of science to to back that. Uh, Dr. Young uh, briefly mentioned frontal subcortical circuits, and I think that's um, uh, that's what we we are most interested in because uh, these so-called non-eloquent areas uh, of the, I mean, everything in the brain is eloquent. That's what Dr. Young taught me. That's what, I, that's what my take home was um, from a very rudimentary understanding, neurosurgical understanding of eloquence versus non-eloquence. Uh, everything is eloquent as he so eloquently um, has taught me. Um, and so we, we, we tend to disrupt a lot of these uh, frontal subcortical networks, um, which are I think four or five in number. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think four, um, yes. uh, with, with these very extensive surgeries that we have done. And, uh, you know, just because we, I can't talk about it because we, we are just in the process of analyzing and, uh, and publishing, but that's, I think the core um, uh, when it comes to prognosis. I think Essen was asking a question even before the prognosis. He's asking the question about how to optimize patients if I understand correctly how to optimize patients for an awake surgery. And that wasn't what we asked. We asked, you know, how can we optimize um, a patient's lives once they have undergone these extensive resections and have these subtle uh, yet uh, measurable cognitive deficits. Um, uh, I think both of these studies are, uh, are intriguing and, and can be done together. But Asan is talking about uh, a prognosis, I mean, um, recovery also, right, Essen? Yes, sir. So and it is post-op as well. Yes, it's important. You know, sometimes I feel, you know, our patients, we, we make them feel a bit, you know, uncomfortable with those blocks and all these things. You know, I don't want them to go with those hard feelings. So I was, mm. I, I don't know what's the like, long-term impact, you know. Well, I think them. we can... We can find the industry here, uh, like, you know, uh, some antidepressants, uh, we can approach them and it won't be very expensive over here uh, because it's just antidepressants that they have to give for a month. Uh, so that's possible over here. I don't know what about over there and we can, you can have a different industry supporting you over there, but the medication has to be the same, right? Right, uh, right, right, right. So yeah, we can talk about it offline, of course. Of course, that's, uh, that's an interest of both uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Young's and mine. Um, you know, another thing to just throw out there was, uh, uh, it just came to my mind when Essen was saying, you know, how, uh, how, how traumatized they are. Is that what you meant, Essen? How traumatized yes, these yes, patients are? Yes, sometimes, not, not all of right. them, but yes, right. sometimes they are. Yeah. So, uh, so this was also a brainchild of Dr. Young. Um, I can have him just briefly uh, comment on that, the, the traumatization. Yes. Yeah, so we administered something called the Trauma Symptom Inventory, TSI, uh, to all of uh, the patients to evaluate that, to see, um, uh, so we got a baseline measure of their traumatization because life can be tra traumatic to uh, some of these patients, and then uh, see how that changed following the surgery. Again, we have this data, haven't analyzed it yet, but we uh, uh, actually administered a trauma symptom inventory to see if their traumatization changed uh, through the surgical intervention. So we have that data. Okay, great. If you, guys can, do, if you guys can do, uh, you know, have a subset of your patients 
uh, come back and 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 undergo that uh, TSI, which is very very quick. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very um, quick. Yeah, so so you know, we, we we do we do with and without uh, uh, antidepressant. We do the TSI pre and post, and we randomize the antidepressant. As in, I mean, yeah. if you are here for another year, do it, man. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Hamza. So we are already talking about one of the clinical trial on the chronotherapy. So you might like to add yes, that. Yes, so definitely. So so it, uh, the time is it over. Doesn't require, then, right? It doesn't require a neuropsychologist. I mean, you you get this measure and you just add it to their packet. Uh, that they right. get on some subsequent visit with you in the clinic and you administer it in clinic. Yep, yep. Is awake craniotomy more beneficial to assess the cognitive and intellectual functions of the brain or for motor functions of both? Moreover, isn't it difficult to assess the motor functions with head fixed in three pin? This is uh, Dr. Awais, uh, and I didn't want to let this question go. Uh, so is, is there any answer to that, uh, uh, Dr. Young, Dr. Johan? No, we, we, we really um, oftentimes, uh, and again, successfully, were able to evaluate motor functioning um, with the patient in pins. Um, we would, uh, you know, depending on what we were looking at, uh, keep their uh, limbs uh, uh, free uh, that we were interested in evaluating it, whether it's their foot, their leg, their hand, uh, their face. Um, but um, I, I can't think of um, any significant difficulty in being able to evaluate uh, motor functioning uh, with patients um, in pins. Henry, Henry Marsh told me a few years ago when we were starting this like five years ago. So Henry Marsh said that he found that patients which are not in pins uh, compared to those which are in pins, he found that those in pins were more comfortable than those that were not in pins. I didn't, I didn't press uh, him with, for more answers. But that's what that's what I mean. Henry Marsh's uh, assessment was about those patients. So, so my memory that. of patients with not in pins, I did. Uh, I started this awake procedure when Dr. Chohan was uh, a resident with uh, a different uh, 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 physician, and patient was not in pins and uh, became very distressed during surgery and tried to get up. <laughs> I had to jump on the patient to keep him down. So um, I prefer patients in pins. <laughs> maybe maybe both the surgeon and the patient are comfortable. <laughs> in yes. <laughs> All right. I hope that answers Dr. Avesh's question. Okay, yes. I am taking over your job, buddy. No, so no, no, sir. That's fine. So I think we're no, done we with the question. We had a wonderful. Anyway. Sorry, sir. You don't get paid anyway for this, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So yeah, that was a wonderful session. So, so uh, Dr. Chohan, director now, if he wants to add some final comments before we wrap up the session. So uh, we are already uh, 15 minutes over. This was a great discussion. I think one of the um, uh, most lively discussions we have had in many, many um, uh, sessions that, uh, um, that we have been conducting for now. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Young, for uh, for coming and sharing your experience, your expertise. Um, I think this uh, has opened um, at least a couple, couple new questions, couple new avenues for us to explore with the Aga Khan team. Um, uh, and uh, as, as always, I love to, uh, to see you, to, to hear you talk and to uh, benefit from, uh, um, from your uh, introspection and your ideas. Uh, so again, uh, very, very thankful to you for, uh, for joining us. Thank, thank, thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. That was truly wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. I and hope to uh, see you all in Pakistan someday. Hey, you're been to welcome. India. You have to come to oh, Pakistan. <laughs> we, will, we will invite you. Yes. Yes. All right. And right, so the, the other announcement is that the next webinar we will have next year because of the you know the holidays coming. So we oh, yes. will have happy holidays and happy new year in advance. See you. Take care. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you everyone from across different part of the country. So Dr. Yan can have a nap. You know he was awake <laughs> six in the morning. <laughs> Saturday morning. This, this is like an awake craniotomy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Without pit, without pins. Without <laughs> pins. <laughs> See you, sir. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye.